Hey everybody, I am so honored to be with Seanan McGuire and or Mira Grant, the uh, two authors in one, today to talk about her contribution to the dystopia triptych. And Seanan also wrote for the apocalypse triptych that John Joseph and I did years ago. Um, love your story, love you, love your writing, love the conversation we had before we got on air about uh, the pandemic. So I wanna, there's so much I wanna go over with you, I don't know where to start, but first, Welcome, thank you for giving me some of your time today. I really appreciate it. Good morning, it. thanks for having me. My pleasure, um, because it's so uplifting talking to you about global pandemics. Um, when, I, when I met you last, uh, or first and most recently, um, it was back during uh, the Chicago WorldCon and feed was like uh, all anyone was talking about at the WorldCon. And it seems like you may have had uh, some thoughts about pandemics before this one. Um, why didn't you warn us? I did. I wrote an entire trilogy warning you. I spent years on social media warning you. The folks at the World Health Organization have been saying for decades that we were overdue for a novel pandemic. Uh, you literally, you. Yeah, you literally cannot say that I didn't warn you. Um, I am not a medical professional. I am someone who studies epidemics and pandemics for fun. Uh, really, my biggest problem anytime there's a big viral outbreak is that a virus is really a machine more than it's a living thing. It's just a little set of instructions terminating in reproduce that goes about its business, and we still don't fully understand how this can be possible. You know, viruses are, they're such truncated little chunks of RNA. They're not life as we understand them, but they are alive. And I just, I find that enthralling the same way that Cory Doctorow does AI. So if you give me a virus that does something unexpected or innovative, I just want to talk about how cool that virus is. And that's a little bit problematic when that virus is killing people. And I recognize and appreciate that. Like it's, it's like being someone who's trying to cook healthy, but also really appreciating the chemical reactions that butter causes in your food. So I have been warning people that a pandemic was coming for ages. For the Newsflesh trilogy, I actually consulted with the CDC for several years. Um, I spent hundreds of hours on the phone with epidemiologists, with members of the EIS, with doctors currently working in public health, trying to figure out how a mass pandemic would play out and what kind of a response we would have to have to survive it. And honestly, at this point, the only thing I really feel like I got wrong is that I was too optimistic. I genuinely thought that we would not have Captain Planet supervillains in charge of things when this finally happened. And, uh, you know, since the, since the coronavirus pandemic has started, I've had my own exciting localized outbreak of people who did not vote for me for the Hugos in Chicago or in Reno, emailing to tell me they didn't vote for me because they thought my villains were too cartoony and <laughs> they wish they had. I get, the same, I get the same comp, uh, complaint about my villains in Wool, and uh, he's like a great guy compared to the people we have. Like, yeah, uh, um, it's, it's e almost evil, like- Evil does evil. exist for evil's sake, and yeah. uh, you get in trouble if you actually paint that uh, realistically in your fiction. Yeah, I don't, I honestly do not think I could write the Newsflesh trilogy today because I was too optimistic. I genuinely thought that if you had something as simple as wear a cloth mask and you reduce the risk of everyone around you, people would just put on a fucking mask. That's been the biggest surprise to me is how easy this thing is to beat. And that, um, and you know, to get, if you want to get really conspiratorial about it, you can see how the divisions uh, through social media were sown years and years ago. Some, a lot mm -hmm. by our own doing, our own in-grouping and out-grouping, some by foreign interference. There's a lot of, uh, trolls and, and Russian um, campaigns that are well publicized and have been prosecuted in court. It's not conspiracy theory. Uh, Putin actually uh, loves seeing us go at each other like this. But if I, if I would have written a book where um, half 30% uh, of our population decided that the economy was more important than their grandparents, uh, it, would, it would be a, a Swiftian 
modest proposal level of satire oh, that, yeah. that you couldn't write. Yeah, you'd have to write knowing that people would chuckle about it. You couldn't write it in a gritty, serious way. And yet that's what we're living through right now. I saw the best thing on Twitter the other day, and I apologize because I can't tell you who it's attributed to. So if you're the person that made this tweet, I am not taking credit for your concept. But somebody had basically said that 2020, the movie that best predicted 2020 was Midsummer, Because oh, we are wow. suddenly willing to sacrifice it's a death cult. our population for a good harvest. Yeah. And as someone whose personal religious leanings have always taken me toward harvest gods, it's a little bit like, wow, yeah. This is straight up sacrifice for the honor of the Great Pumpkin. Except the Great Pumpkin doesn't want your shitty ass sacrifices. The Great Pumpkin wants to be allowed to go trick-or-treating on Halloween, and he's not gonna because y'all won't wear fucking masks. <laughs> I love you. I, that movie was so shocking. I, people warned me. I, I went into it not knowing anything about the plot, but knowing to be prepared to be disturbed, and it still got me. Um, and uh, 2020 is doing the same thing so far. I, I left my hotel room at a convention once without putting a bra on first. It was like 6 a.m. in the morning. I was street legal. I was wearing enough clothes that I could have gone outside. And I went down to the Starbucks in the lobby. And there were blog posts about Hugo Award nominee Sean and McGuire so disrespectful, flaunting her nipples. Oh my God, she's such a slob. Like, I got more public shaming for not wearing a bra to pick up a cup of coffee than people are getting for having their whole ass faces hanging out in the store when they could have an infectious disease that will kill me. I'm immunocompromised. I really don't want to die. I, look, I, I get on people when they wear their masks the wrong way. I'm like, you know, we uh, had some food being delivered to us in a takeout here in New York, and someone had their mask on with their nose, just like, you know, yeah, it's useless mask at that mouth. point. And I was like, yeah, you might want to just pull that up a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's, and like we were talking beforehand, you know, everyone's concentrating on the people who might lose their life. And it's been a lot of people, like more than every war since World War II. Um, and each one of these is a tragedy. We can't get inured to the big number. But the people who are just getting sick, and you and I both have friends who have been sick for months um, over this, and, and we don't know what the long-term consequences. And it's it's baffling to me that, all it would take, literally, this thing burns out if it does not have us as a vehicle to transmit it. If everyone sat inside and watched Netflix for three weeks and the government covered our rent, yep. add an extra week, make it a month, and no one moves. Wear your mask, wash your hands, sterilize if you have to leave the house. Yeah, it's that easy. If it were guaranteed to kill me, I wouldn't be as freaked out about it. But what we're seeing as side effects, we're seeing permanent lung, permanent lung damage, we're seeing kidney failure. Um, I had a massive health scare last year in Dublin, right after the Worldcon. I actually died while I was in Glasgow, Scotland, like clinically died. They had to jumpstart me back on. Sounds like one of your books. Um, well, the thing about that was, was my doctor was afraid as a consequence of everything that I had gone through that we might've damaged my kidneys. And so for a week, while we waited for test results to come back, I had to count every gram of sodium I took in with a max cap of 1,000 grams of sodium a day. And that seems like such a huge number until you actually start trying to count it. I can't live like that. That's how much I, I put on one French fry. Yeah, I discovered very quickly that kidney damage is the thing I, that is my boogeyman now. Uh, COVID is causing permanent organ damage. It's causing strokes and heart attacks in otherwise healthy young adults. We're getting reports now of asymptomatic people suffering from neurological effects that we don't know if they're permanent or not. I read in Alabama, kids were having parties where the goal was to see who could get COVID first. It's like kind of a, a dare, like kids. I mean, we had a Tide Pod fad for a while, so nothing should surprise me anymore. But when I read that, I thought, Again, like my, my job as a satirist and a um, post-apocalyptic dystopian author is like being taken away from me. Yeah, how do you do that? And it's because we've put so much stress on, well, you'll probably live. Yeah. You know, starting in 2014, my left foot developed a, a condition that we're still trying to fully understand. There's some kind of nerve problem in there, but it means that periodically my left foot is not load-bearing. 
I'll be walking along and then suddenly I'll put my foot down, start screaming and fall down. And this is a level of disability that leaves me capable of doing everything but walking. I can swim, I can talk, I can sing, I can think, I can cognate, and it has still been fucking miserable. There is nothing wrong with a disabled life. You can have a perfectly happy, perfectly you know, functional, as productive as you want it to be life while also having a disability, but going out and courting a disease that will leave you disabled is ridiculous. Yes. And it's because the media spin has been so focused on, well, you'll be alive. Yeah, it seems crazy to focus on that number. And I wish we did a better job covering these other consequences. I mean, those, those of us who are like reading um, uh, medical reports and following these closely understand that, but other people don't. Speaking of um, the medical system, so many of your stories touch on uh, this issue, which I know is important to you. The stories for this anthology, the series of anthologies as well, focuses on um, you know, how impoverished we are in this country because of um, basic needs that aren't met and the, the, the links people go to just to pay their bills. And I found, I found your story completely haunting because I have friends who just because of one traffic accident, one medical issue, uh, they'll never be able to gain wealth. They'll never be able to save up. They will die in, uh, in debt because of something they had no control over. And you took this to such an extreme, I don't want to spoil anything for readers, but such a horrific extreme that uh, was shocking. And I think the kind of story you, we need to wake people up on how absurd our system is. I mentioned Swift's a modest proposal earlier, but this reminded me of that, like, you know, eat the poor, basically, that level of absurdity. But I feel like that's what we see in our system today. So what, tell me about, just give me a, a, a blasting of your anger about our medical system. I mean, America is a ridiculously Calvinist country. We have this inbuilt attitude, culturally, that if you are poor, if you are somehow disadvantaged, it's because you deserve it. People are poor because they are bad people. And thus, by contrast, rich people are rich because they are good people. So this system that says Paris Hilton is inherently a better person than I am because she was born to millionaires while I was born into welfare. And uh, that has led to us being the only, unquote, developed nation that doesn't have completely universal health care. We don't guarantee health as a public right for our people, the way that Canada, Mexico, Scotland, England, all of the Scandinavian countries, Germany, all of them do. If you're, one, if you're a citizen in one of those countries, you don't have to worry about medical bankruptcy. And now we have more and more uh, former insurance executives coming forth and acknowledging that they intentionally lied to the American people to make us think that socialized systems were worse they went out of their way to say, oh, Canada's bad. You might have to wait in Canada. But it's all part of Calvinism. You know, America, we all want to think of ourselves as disadvantaged millionaires. Uh, <laughs> again, well I, I am a disabled person. I can't walk long distances because of something that we don't know what it is. We don't know if it was my fault or not. It just sort of happened. Um, so when I go to Disney parks, when I go to Disney World, I use the disability access program. I rent a mobility scooter because I can't physically walk through the park. And that gives me access to certain areas of the park that someone on foot won't necessarily have, while also denying me access to parts of the park that my scooter won't fit in. And periodically, somebody figures out that disabled people are enjoying Disney, and they throw a fit, and then there's a big review of the program. And what they find every single fucking time, and you can look this up, this is in Disney shareholder reports, this is publicly accessible information, every single fucking time is that 2% of people using the disability access program are abusing it. They don't actually need to be using it. One person in 50. A whopping 2%. A, t a whopping 2%. One person in 50 is taking advantage of a system they don't actually need. So that means that for every cheater, nine people who could not enjoy Disney without that system is using that system, are using that system to enjoy it. Now, Disney also has a thing called the docent program. And with the docent program, you can pay money to have a movie star experience of Disney. Mm -hmm. For 10,000 
$5 a day, they will give you a private Disney docent who will walk you and up to 20 friends to the front of any line. For the entire day, you get every single thing you want. You can cut the lines. You want Anna and Elsa to come and sit with your kids at lunch, 10 grand a day, and that's going to happen. And that program doesn't piss off nearly as many people. Yeah, and no one gets mad because everybody wants to think that someday they are going to be a millionaire. They are going to be able to afford that docent program. No one wants to think that someday they're going to be disabled. And that attitude feeds straight into the way that we handle medical care. If you're a millionaire, yes, you can pay to go to the front of the line. In a socialized system, it doesn't work that way. In a socialized system, it's all emergency room triage. And if I come in screaming because my foot isn't weight bearing anymore and you've stubbed your toe, I'm going to go ahead of you even if you're rich and I'm not. And we don't like that. Yeah. We are the only nation where medical bankruptcy destroys lives. It destroys families. I know so many people who have died years before their time because they didn't seek help. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're scared of the, uh, the crushing you're burden. Of the of the, yeah. I, and I think you nailed it with the, the, the concept of everyone thinking that they're a future millionaire. People vote against their interests because they want a system that is tilted in the favor of where they hope they'll end up one day. And the reality is they're not going to end up there. So you have people, uh, a lot of poor people voting against universal health care when it will benefit them. Um, and it's also racism. Well, education. And a lot of racism. because It's a look, lot of racism. It's going to hurt me, but it's going to hurt them worse. Yep. And I people, know a lot of people who will vote against anything that they think might benefit families of color, immigrant families, black people especially. And that goes back to the founding of our country when the slave owners figured out that if they could just turn the poor whites against the black people, if they could convince us that we had more in common with the slaveholders than we did with the slaves, we would be a controllable police force that would help them keep people in their place. It's basically, we are the nation proving crab bucket syndrome. The proving what? Um, crab bucket syndrome. Crab bucket. Yeah, it's if you take a crab and you put one crab in a bucket, just one, that crab will get the fuck out of the bucket and now there's a crab loose in your kitchen doing whatever the hell it wants because it's a crab. Okay. If you put two crabs in a bucket, then as soon as the first crab starts to pull itself out, the second crab will grab it and pull it back down. No way. The crabs will keep themselves in the bucket rather than another crab be the first one to get out. They don't work together. They don't support their own interests. They could own your fucking house. 50 crabs loose in your house. That's not your house anymore. But they won't do that because they're all too busy keeping each other in the bucket. That's interesting. I was um, did a talk with uh, Darcy Little Badger yesterday, and we were talking about how when the settlers arrived, if, if, if every Native American tribe had banded together, they could have kept us out a lot longer. They probably would have lost eventually the technology, unless they absorbed enough technology that they could build smallpox. up. Smallpox. They would yeah, have small, lost because smallpox. Of smallpox. Took out most of them before we even showed up, I think. Like Vikings probably brought that over before we even showed up. But uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I love this crab in a bucket. Um, it, I, I wonder if aliens invaded us, if we would make the same mistake and we would um, all be s scrambling to make sure that we emerged on top with our old divisions rather than combining in an Independence Day sort of uh, fight them off scenario. I mean, I've been saying since I was three years old that I was the vanguard of an invading race of alien plant people on our way to eat your puny, puny world. So I'm really hoping that humanity will continue to fracture and just let us take over. <laughs> And you tripped me out. <laughs> no, it is. You can ask my mother. It is consistent. When I was three, I came out of the woods behind my grandparents' house, walked up to my mom and told her the aliens came. They took your real baby, but it's okay. I'm here now. How does she take that? Well, I was a weird kid, so she just kind of went, okay, well, you're here. Let's go. Um, and at this point, we don't honestly know whether I believe that or not, because I have been so consistent since I was three years old. That's a long time to insist that you are the vanguard of an invading race of alien plants. God, that reminds me of, what was that Jordan Peele movie that came out recently where you can't remember? Us? If, yeah, uh, she can't remember if you're the real one or not, because it's been so long. Um, maybe, maybe you're actually Mira Grant. Maybe. In, in your home world. That's your cow L. I mean, we're plants, so less that and, and more Audrey too, but. <laughs> or the uh, little shop of horrors. 
Um, man, I we sh- I I want to talk to you every day. This is uh, <laughs> this has been the best best thing that's happened to me in quarantine. Um, what do you, what are you working on now? What's next for you? Uh, well, how- currently I am working on a short story for Ed Willett's Shapers of Worlds anthology. It's called In Silent Streams, where once the summer shone, and it's uh, basically about as optimistic as you would expect from this summer. Uh, and I'm working on the novella that will be packaged with the next encrypted book, which is called Singing Those Comic-Con Blues. Um, awesome. Well, and I'm lo- very excited because yesterday Marvel announced that they will actually be releasing Ghost Spider issues 9 and 10 in print, which they hadn't because Corona shut down our printers. How's that going to work? How are they going to distribute and how can we get our hands on comics? Through the comic book stores. If you go yeah. to your local comic book store, you'll be able to obtain a copy. Cool. Or if you contact the Comic Stop in Woodenville, Washington, you can get a signed copy. They'd be happy to mail you one. Um, cool, I might do that and add that to my collection. Yeah, if you like comic books, it's important to support your local comic book store right now because comics have been trying to pivot a bit to digital for a while. And I do worry that that's going to give us a future where it's only Batman and the Avengers. Everything else is going to fade away. Yeah, I I um, keep my local comic book shop uh, afloat, I think, and I just put like a huge box of comics that I've read on the on the street with a sign to try to get more people hooked on them. I think uh, some adults were walking by and they were like, "Those are free," and I'm like, "Yeah, people were digging Big in." And, yeah, so um, yeah, we definitely need to support our local shops, especially through all this. Um, well, stay awesome, stay busy, love your work. Thank you so much for contributing. To our anthology. Thank you for having me and for letting uh, me slippery slope another medical catastrophe. I can't wait for you to get your hands on these books. They're really beautiful. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to see them. They look lovely. Yeah, they should be on their way to you. So you'll you'll get them within the week. I hope. Yay! All right, stay awesome, Sean. Thank you. You too, Hugh. Bye.